can do that now. There we go. Okay, shall we start then? Sure. Can everyone hear us? Okay, good. Right. Welcome everyone to our latest OTS webinar on delivery of macromolecular therapeutics, tackling a billion year old barrier with Steve Dowdy from the University of California, San Diego in America. Um, as usual, the webinar will be recorded and made available on the OTS website and um, all webinar participants are muted to minimize background and noise levels. So if you have any questions, please, please type them into the chat box and Steve will answer them at the end of the talk. Right, then over to you, Steve. Okay, great. Um, so we've got to go back to the very beginning, which is the primordial RNA soup, um, the way the world existed four billion years ago. And then shortly after that was the invention of the lipid bilayer. And the lipid bilayer um, basically separates nucleic acids and macromolecules on the outside from those that are on the inside of the nascent cell. And this allowed chemistries and of course the conservation of genetic information to occur on the inside, separate from the outside. And, and it also prevented um, invading nucleic acids such as viruses and phage from infecting inside of the nascent cell. So after this was the evolution of RNA interference. And I'm going to focus my talk today on delivery of RNAi triggers, but the, the principles are applicable to all macromolecular molecules, whether they're proteins or ASOs or siRNAs or ADER oligonucleotides or even uh, large LNPs. They all have the same issues to deal with. So with the evolution of microRNA allowed the post-translational regulation of mRNA, and this opened up a world of opportunity to develop therapeutics um, to target and knock down specific genes. RNAi has this very low EC50, around one picomolar. It's catalytic. It targets all mRNAs, and that allows you to do things you could never dream of doing, of course, with um, small molecule inhibitors. But the problem is drugs like double-stranded siRNAs, in this case, what's modeled here as a 21 mer double-stranded, where the green is the sequence and the ribose and the orange is the phosphodiester linkages, is that they have terrible drug-like properties. Um, and we'll walk through each of those right now. So small molecules, in contrast, are selected and synthesized to be under 500 Daltons, essentially Lipinski's rule of five. If you've never read that paper, you should go read that paper. And this is that these small molecules that are a little bit greasy, have a nice log P value, they have no charges, very low hydrophilicity, can passively diffuse across the lipid bilayer and essentially reach equilibrium inside of the cells. So, and, and the example here is AZT, which is a mononucleotide inhibitor um, of reverse transcriptase for HIV. However, if you phosphorylate um, AZT, which is actually the active form of the drug, that a single phosphate on an otherwise uh, passively diffusible molecule completely prevents its ability from getting across the lipid bilayer. So even though the phosphorylated, the alpha phosphorylated AZT is still under 500 Daltons, because of that phosphate's charge, completely prevents its ability to get across the lipid bilayer, which of course was designed to keep molecules like this outside of the cell. So when we go back to the siRNA, then a 21 mer is not only has 40 phosphates versus just one that prevents a small molecule from passively diffusing, but it's also 25 times too large to passively diffuse across the cell membrane, even if it didn't have any charged phosphates. So this is a huge problem for delivery of RNA therapeutics. And in fact, this billion-year-old barrier was in designed emphatically to keep molecules like invading nucleic acids, essentially siRNAs, from, get, from the outside, from getting to the inside of the cell. But on top of the evolution of single cells, as metazoans appeared on the planet, 
then more and more layers of um, protection, evolutionary defenses were put into place to uh, prevent invading nucleic acids. And first and foremost are RNAs. And RNAs use the two prime hydroxyl to attack the phosphate to lead to a strand scission. And that's how they discriminate between DNA and between RNA. And your fingers exude um, RNAs your cell phone, your computer is just covered in RNAs as a way to um, defeat invading naked nucleic acids, plasma RNAs. So for luckily for RNA therapeutics, there's a very straightforward solution. And that solution is just to substitute a two prime fluoro or a two prime omethyl or a MOE for ASOs. And that completely um, dramatically, I should say, uh, decreases ability of RNAs to attack that phosphodiester linkage by having these. So this adds a tremendous amount of metabolic stability. And you can see that when you go from, uh, in using 50% human serum, you go from a fully wild type two prime hydroxyl to a fully two prime modified, that there's a much longer half-life of the overall um, molecule. Eventually, of course, it does get degraded. As you increase more and more content of O-methyl on sRNAs, then you really push that stability much longer than 24 hours. Um, this, the next layer of defense is the kidneys for metazoans. And if you inject a naked sRNA with a dye on it, and then you just look to see what happens, first pass kinetics, 95% or more of the dose is in the bladder in five minutes. So these are cleared from the body because your body views this, those orange phosphates, your body views those as a salt and wants to get it out of the blood to keep the osmolality of the blood um, in just the right spot. So this is another huge problem. One way around this potentially is if you added a protein binding motif that would bind to serum albumin, for instance, and prevent it from being cleared by the kidneys in a first pass. Um, this really hasn't been utilized very uh, extensively in the literature, either the academic literature or in uh, the biotech clinical trials. But as you get out of liver and into other organs, this is going to become more and more of an issue of this charged backbone. My lab synthesized phosphotriesters that neutralize that backbone. I'm not going to go into that chemistry today, but at the end of the talk is a reference for that. And that's another way to potentially avoid uh, clearance by the kidney is directly neutralizing the phosphates with bioreversible phosphotriesters. So the next layer on top of this is the innate immune response. TLRR receptors, and for double-stranded siRNAs, it's TLR3 that's the main problem, but TLR7 and 8 are also issues. Um, and these are pattern repeat um, receptors that then activate the innate immune response. So one way to potentially defeat that is again by having two prime modifications of fluoros and omethyls because the binding site here on the TLRs is not sequence specific, it's the bas backbone. It's the ribose and the phosphates that are making contact in these repetitive units of TLRs. And if you modify that two prime hydroxyl to something that essentially doesn't look like a two prime hydroxyl um, to the TLRs, then you dramatically prevent um, binding to TLRs. There are sequences you need to avoid as well too. So the fifth problem is naked siRNAs are not taken up into cells. So they, as I said earlier, they cannot passively diffuse across the cell membrane and they're not taken up into cells appreciably. So you need a targeting domain in order to concentrate it at the cell of interest and that'll be taken up by endocytosis. Um, and Galnec, of course, is the most famous one for delivering siRNAs and Javosaran was just approved last month as the first galnet conjugate, and ASOs with galnet conjugates that are targeting to the liver as well, too. And this really concentrates and ends up in an endosome. So then the biggest problem by far is once you're in the endosome, this is kind of like your breakfast or lunch, depending on where you are on the planet right now, and um, this is biologically outside of the cell. Just because you're inside of an endosome does not mean that you're accessible to the argonaut machinery for RNAi or GAPMERS for RNA sage activity or splice alteration, et cetera. So you need to get across the endosomal lipid bilayer in order to be loaded and, and perform your, um, your mechanism of action of whatever particular RNA um, 
function that you have. So the vast majority of uh, molecules, in fact, greater than 99% stays trapped inside the endosome and a teeny tiny fraction actually escapes. So for siRNAs, the calculation by Anders Whitrup at uh, Lund University is about 2,000, 1,000 siRNAs per cell to reach a maximum RNAi response. In contrast, you need 100,000 to 500,000 small molecules that are passively diffusing across the cell membrane. So the good news is you need a very small number of molecules to actually escape. The bad news is, is that the escape rate is way lower than that 1,000 or 2,000 or 5,000 threshold for ASOs that you need. And so this is the problem that we'll spend most of the time today. And I just wanted to interject here some nomenclature, and that is when people talk about uptake, so uptake is endocytosis. This is entrapment inside of an endosome. That is not biologically accessible to the machinery inside the cell that the ASO or the sRNA therapeutic is trying to modulate. So being inside the endosome doesn't do anything for you in terms of um, targeting genes. So delivery is actually uptake plus endosomal escape. If you don't escape from the endosome, it basically doesn't count. But that is actual delivery to the cell. Merely having it taken up by a cell um, does not indicate that it's actually going to work as a potential therapeutic or as a, a gene um, moderator. Okay, so um, this problem of endosomal escape is not only a problem for double-stranded siRNAs, it's also the problem for ASOs, it's a problem for lipid nanoparticles, so a, a three kilobase mRNA doesn't sound that big until you look at the molecular weight, it's about one megadaltons or one million daltons, it has no chance of being taken up into cells and escaping the endosome on its own. So it needs to be packaged inside of a nanoparticle. Lipid nanoparticles are state-of-the-art ionizable. Lipid nanoparticles are state-of-the-art. And um, now you're in a 100 nanometer lipid nanoparticle, which sounds small, but that's actually about 100 million Daltons in size molecular weight. So we're going from a one megadalton to a hundred megadaltons so that we can both protect the mRNA from RNAs because you can't um, appreciably two prime modify this RNA using the polymerases today. Um, and this, the LMP also facilitates both uptake and endosomal escape. Um, same with CRISPR RNPs, CRISPR mRNAs. Um, so the RNPs are about 150 kilodaltons when they're loaded with the guide strand. That is way too big to be, that's 300 times Lipinski's rule to passively diffuse across the membrane. And so whether this is inside of a nanoparticle or whether you capture it inside of it, I am sorry, whether it's free as an RMP or whether you capture it inside of a nanoparticle, these are still huge macromolecules that have no chance of escaping from the endosome. And of course, DNA vectors, a five kilobase DNA vector is about three megadaltons in size. So um, all of these nanoparticle approaches, of course, need this 100 megadalton, you know, plus or, minus 20, plus or minus 20 megadaltons in order to be delivered into the cells. But even for the best well-characterized LNP, MC3, less than 1% of these LNPs that are endocytosed actually escape into the cytoplasm. So in, escape from the endosome is hands down the rate limiting problem to be solved. And so if you're keeping score here, nature's been working at this for about three and a half billion years of keeping nucleic acids on the outside from getting to the inside. And humans, yeah, we have about 50 or 60 years of chemistry that we've been able to apply that have been able to solve many of these problems but the one problem by far we haven't really just even scratched the surface is endosomal escape. And that's really preventing the development for a wide variety of diseases, cancer, pandemic influenza, Ebola. Um, you could imagine all sorts of diseases that could be treated with precision genetic medicine, such as ASOs and siRNAs, if we could enhance delivery tenfold or a hundredfold or even a thousandfold. So um, our approach has been if we take a bunch of uh, targeting domains, small molecules such as folate or DUPA, um, small uh, nanobodies essentially, centurions, 
at Karen O'Neill um, at Johnson & Johnson, now at Arrow has done a really beautiful job with these. And these are fibronectin repeats that essentially have CDR-like loops on them that will target um, proteins with very high avidity and of course antibodies. And so if you take these different, you know, from small to very large type of targeting domains and you conjugate them to an siRNA and you add them to cells of interest, you get absolutely no RNAi response. And there are reports where you'll get some responses. And in our hands, we just do not get robust RNAi responses. And the reason why is because 99 plus percent of it remains trapped inside of these endosomes. If you label any of these with a dye, if you label any of these with a dye, that it's all in live cells where you're not torturing the cells. Um, if you fix them, you can get redistribution that would uh, fool you into thinking that you actually had a decent amount of escape. But in fact, the vast majority of this is trapped inside these punctated endosomes. And again, that's really the problem to solve. So if we go to Galnac, um, so Galnac obviously works, right? We just had Javosaran approved. Um, Galnac as a trimer binds to the ASGPR receptor, which is vastly overexpressed on uh, human hepatocytes. And there's half a million to a million of the ASGPR receptors. They recycle every 15 minutes. And so you're bringing in potentially half a million molecules or more into an endosome every 15 minutes. So of the subcutaneous dose, about 70% of this on first pass is actually endocytosed into hepatocytes. But there's this very slow, less than 1% of this that actually escapes into the cytoplasm and then could affect an RNAi response. And again, the number here um, from uh, originally, um, from Judy Lieberman's lab with uh, Anders Whitrup, who's now an assistant professor at Lund University, is about 1,000 or 2,000 siRNAs per cell. So again, you don't need a lot of escape for this to affect. And so having a million molecules come in every 15 minutes with a teeny tiny amount escaping, then after several days, you basically get to the 1,000 number. So if you just assume that the escape rate is about 10 siRNAs per hour, can actually, in some unknown fashion, escape from the inside of the endosome into the cytoplasm, then it takes about four days to reach a maximum RNAi response. And that's exactly what you see in the clinics. When you deliver by Galnac, it's not this very rapid um, knockdown that happens in 24 hours. It's this very slow knockdown that maxes out at about four or five days. And so that's consistent with a rate of escape of about 10. And then the rest of these, because of the metabolic stability, because of the two prime modifications, predominantly the O-methyls, hang out in this endosome and then presumably are slowly escaping over the next two, three, six months in the case of enclisiran. So um, how does this happen? Nobody knows how there's a breach in the endosome that this highly charged siRNA that does not bind to protein appreciably at all because of those, because of these uh, orange phosphodiesters, they just don't bind protein unless it's an RNA specific binding protein, which are not present inside the endosome as far as we know. Um, the O-methyls are, back to Lipinski's rule in the log P, they are greasy. And the two prime position, this is the minor groove of double-stranded A-form helix. And in there, the phosphates are rotated more than they are in DNA, where one of the phosphates is pointed down into the major groove and the other one is part, pointed partially out. But the two prime position, originally the hydroxyls, in fact, are pointed straight up off of the minor groove into solution. And so now when you have an O-methyl in purple here, modeled in purple, then you are adding a little bit of grease to the backbone. So the O-methyl may very well not only help with metabolic stability, but it may help with a little bit of grease that allows this really pathetic rate of 10 an hour to escape. And so you will hear people say that that actually is good. Because in the case of enclisiran, where you have a single dose and a six-month response, that you have a reservoir of 99%. But in fact, the vast majority of this over six months never actually escapes. And of course, to treat cancer and other diseases, we just haven't been able to do that at all. So galnec targeting is really a, a gift from God and a special circumstance 
where you can tolerate such a low amount of escape because you have a million molecules coming in of the RNA therapeutic every 15 minutes. So if we contrast that now, oh, and the same is true of ASOs. So whereas less than 1% in our calculations, it's 0.1% of an siRNA escapes an endosome. For ASOs up at Ionis, um, they have good data that about 1% of ASOs actually escape over time um, across the endosomal lipid bilayer. Now, ASOs are different than siRNAs because they have a phosphothioate backbone and phosphothioates actually bind to protein. And so that can actually help facilitate interacting with endosomal luminal proteins that then would potentially facilitate escape. But this question of how these, they're still highly charged molecules, even though they have a phosphothioate, that's still a negative charge on the sulfur, that how that highly negatively charged a molecule that's 10 times bigger than Lipinski's rules can actually get across a lipid bilayer. And again, it uh, likely is the fact that you need very few of these, maybe 5,000 of these as a Gatmer to get a complete maximum RNA-CH respond knockdown of a target gene. So um, if we go to other receptors and we look at receptors in cancer, I'm by training a cancer biologist, that um, HER2 in breast cancer when it's amplified is about 100,000, 10 to the fifth. Um, CD33 in AML is about 10,000 receptors per cell. So we're down already uh, from the 10 to the six or uh, 0.5 by 10 to the six receptors. We're already down 10 or 100 fold when you look at other receptors. The other problem is that these receptors recycle about every 90 minutes because this is taken up by more classic forms of endocytosis, clathrin, caviolin. So when you just do the simple math on the back of the envelope, the difference between the amount of material that can be taken in by these receptors versus the ASGPR is about a hundred fold lower. So if you assume that the this unknown escape across the lipid bilayer, but if you just assume that that can happen in these endosomes, which we don't know, um, with these other receptors versus the the same the endosomes that are in the ASGPR, the ASGPR induced endosomes, then um, if you just assume that whatever that scape mechanism is also functioning here, we need to make up a hundred fold. And if you try to do that just by bumping up the dose a hundred fold, um, you're gonna hit a maximum tolerated dose due to the toxicity. And of course the cost of goods is gonna go up a hundred fold in exposure to the patient as well too. So we need a better way to come up with um, getting up to 100x um, so that we could get even to this lowest level of escape that the ASGBR has. And so one way to do this is if you add endolytic agents such as chloroquine, which is a classic endolytic agent that's used to originally to kill malarial parasites because that feed vacuole, that endosome, is actually very sensitive to chloroquine more so than all of our endosomes in our body. So if you add chloroquine in trans, chloroquine is a small molecule. It passively diffuses across the cell membrane. It passively diffuses across the endosomal membrane. But as the pH drops in the endosome, uh, chloroquine has three nitrogens. These get protonated and that traps it now because it has a positive charge, traps it inside the endosome. So while you may have micromolar concentration outside the cell, you can have millimolar concentrations inside of the endosome. And that ultimately uh, inserts this hydrophobic motif into the lipid bilayer when it reaches a certain critical concentration. And that blows open the whole endosome, releasing the siRNA, and then thereby allowing you to get an RNAi response. So in principle, that sounds great. Problem solved, just add an endolytic agent. However, these agents are so toxic because the critical concentration that's required in order to get your cargo to escape from this endosome is also the concentration that blows apart this endosome that has none of your cargo, it may not even be in the same cell or the same tissue. And so all endosomes then are susceptible to being blown apart by endolytic molecules like chloroquine. And there's three or four of these that have been published, especially in the last five or 10 years, as more and more work has been put on the endosomal escape problem. 
So while chloroquine serves to demonstrate that endosomal escape is really the rate limiting problem to be solved today, um, you can't add these molecules in trans and expect them to work. Um, and the other thing I would say is bursting the entire endosome because there's all sorts of things inside here besides the cargo we're interested in delivering that all of these are gonna lead to very nasty things happening to the cells in terms of toxicity and innate immune response and infectivity of virus particles or bacteria are trapped inside the endosome. And if they can't escape, these type of drugs would uh, facilitate their escape too. So that's not a, um, an approach that one can move forward. So in contrast to that approach is back to evolution, the way viruses do this. So envelope viruses, especially such as influenza, Ebola, they have fused, they have the exact same problem of endosomal escape. So they bind to receptors that stimulate endocytosis. They're inside the endosome. Viruses are very large, 20, 40, 80 nanometers in diameter. So these are still 20 million Dalton uh, molecules or, or viruses, and they can't passively diffuse across that lipid body. Layer. So they need to um, insert a fusogenic domain that causes a localized membrane destabilization, and that facilitates escape of the virus into the cytoplasm, whereby it has access to all the host machinery to replicate. So um, for uh, influenza, it's the HA2 domain, and it's a trimer, and this trimer essentially inserts itself into the lipid bilayer and then um, thereby doing that destabilize it. So it's called a fusogenic protein, but it's really a membrane destabilizer. And as lipid bilayers spontaneously heal themselves, as long as the hole's not too large, you don't need an enzyme to heal lipid bilayers, that that fuses the envelope membrane with the endosomal membrane and then injects the capsid into the cytoplasm. So we wanted to um, use this idea of having a, um, mimic of an HA2. If you use HA2, we all have antibodies to hemagglutinin. And so you can't use this type of, of machinery. Not only that, this is a big protein machine. And, and if you try to put this onto a um, conjugate, this is not going to function in the way it functions when you have this large viral surface. So we wanted to do this synthetically. And we set up a screen for endosomal escape. So with GFP, GFP has 11 beta sheets. And if you take away one of those beta sheets, beta sheet number 11, you have a, a large fragment that you can stably express in cells, but it has no fluorescence. And if you add back that GFP beta 11, the dark green bar here, it will load in trans into GFP, and that allows formation of the chromophore and fluorescence of GFP. So cells expressing the large fragment, no fluorescence. If you add the GFP beta 11 peptide in trans, it'll load and you'll get fluorescence. And so we use this as a screen, a live cell screen, and because you can do real time kinetics here, using this uh, beta 11 it was attached to a delivery domain and then what we call an endosomal escape domain, EED. And we screen through a library of 200 of these. And what we found was I'm just focusing on the ones that worked here. The vast majority of these did not work. Um, we wanted to use uh, relatively short peptides that would not be presented in the adaptive immune response um, in the MHC. And so I'm just showing some of the ones that we focused on here. So what we're looking at here is fold increase in GFP versus the parental. So the parental does not have the EED on it. It just is the actual, in this case, the TAT delivery domain and the beta 11 sheet onto it. And there's a dose dependent um, increase in GFP. And so when we look at this collection, we see some that don't work at all, some that work okay, several that work pretty good. And then we see one that works really good that you would think would be the lead guy to go forward. And that's EED8. But this EED8 also drops off at the higher concentrations. And the reason that it drops off is because it's incredibly toxic. So EED8 has three tryptophans versus EED5, which has a fee trip fee, um, two trips here, which is EED6, which is this line, um, yellow line, orange line here, um, works pretty similarly. But if you go from two tryptophans and, or uh, three uh, phenylalanines to um, four, or to three, sorry, uh, tryptophans, 
then uh, you basically go from working in a low toxicity to something that works better but has extremely high toxicity. So if this was a, a truly universal approach that um, these were inserting into the lipid bilayer, it should work on a wide variety of cells. These cells are H1299 or human lung adenocarcinoma cells. There's nothing particularly special about them, but this same uh, ED5 compared to the parent works on uh, human immortalized keratinocytes, Hackett cells, and two different breast carcinoma cell lines. And so we see the same thing of about a five to eight tenfold dose shift to the left when you have the EED5 on there. And this is exactly what we would expect that these are inserting into the lipid bilayer to destabilize that membrane. So after we did all of this, we went back to all of our targeting domains. We conjugated them to the RNA. We then conjugated three of the endosomal escape domains to the RNA, one, two, or three. And then we looked for RNA activity and nada. We got nothing. Um, and the reason why is these underwent hydrophobic collapse. And so we were limited by the solution exposed hydrophobicity because these are so hydrophobic with aromatic residues that they would prefer to stack on each other and cause toxicity before they would actually get into the endosome and do their job of escaping. So while the single EED worked when the cargo was this small peptide, about 1800 Daltons, um, for an siRNA with the targeting domain, we could get this into the endosome and they would just be incredibly toxic by adding it, when we added it to cells. And so while these were, some it was in a cytose, the toxicity was so high because of the hydrophobic collapse that this was just not going to go forward at all. So nice idea, but we kind of blew it because in fact, we were trying to mimic the HA2 um, properties of having this hydrophobic motif, this trimer that inserts into the lipid bilayer. But in fact, that's not at all what uh, nature has done. So influenza does not have an HA2 exposed on the cell surface. It's masked by an HA1 domain that's connected with a loop to the HA2 domain. And the HA1 domain is a hydrophilic mask. So out in blood and plasma, what's presented to the cell is an HA1 hydrophilic mask that covers the HA2 hydrophobic core. The, the parental protein is HA0. So once this gets into the endosome, as the pH drops and proteases are activated, the HA1 gets clipped off and ejected. And the HA2 now is exposed, but only in the endosome and only when the virus is essentially attached through receptors to the cell surface. So when the hydrophobic domain of HA2 is exposed, then it wants to bury itself in another hydrophobic environment, that being the lipid bilayer that causes this localized membrane disruption and endosomal escape of the virus. So um, we wanted to basically synthesize a second generation endosomal escape domain that had a synthetic hydrophilic mask around it that would have these same properties. And again, you can't just mimic the hemagglutinin protein because it's hugely antigenic and it's this big machine. You can't put that big machine onto an sRNA or any ASO conjugate. It's gonna dramatically alter the biophysical properties, the PK, the metabolic stability, the adaptive immune response. There's all these issues with that. So we wanna do this strictly synthetically, something that non-peptide that would um, not be loaded into the MHC for an adaptive immune response, but would essentially mimic this idea of jettisoning a hydrophilic mask and exposing a hydrophobic core that would bury itself and cause this localized membrane disruption. And so this is just that uh, general idea that I just said. And essentially, we have the chemistry here under construction. We've made very good progress. Um, we're not there yet, but um, I think it's doable. Um, I think it's it's very doable from a strictly synthetic point of view. Okay, so just to kind of round out here, all right, what does it take to deliver an RNA outside of Galnec? Um, number one, it takes a targeting domain. And of course, Galnec is a targeting domain. We like antibodies. I kind of went kicking and screaming with antibodies, but there are thousands of published antibodies and all the CDRs are in the patent literature. And so you can drop the CDRs, the binding domains, 
onto a scaffold of a humanized IgG1 or an IgG4 and produce these in your lab using media produced and sold by Life Technologies. So you can make 10 milligrams of antibody for about 250 bucks in 10 days with about four hours of your effort. And you can do this in any lab um, in the world with just having a, a platform shaker, a bench platform shaker, put it into your uh, 37 degree incubator and you can make antibodies. Um, it's amazingly simple now. And so I would direct you to Life Technology to do that. And so what we do is we've engineered site selective handles into these and that allows for conjugation of specific, uh, at specific locations rather than trying to conjugate all around. And the antibody drug field has really been the leader in site selective conjugation. Seattle Genetics has done a, a beautiful job, Amgen and Genentech with this as well too. So we like antibodies because of the high cell selectivity combined to a number of receptors that are available. Um, and they have long PK. They've been selected for long PK. And long PK is really important when you're talking about treating cancer because you need a very, very long PK to get as many shots on tumor as possible. If you're Galnec, Galnec first pass clearage is by the liver. If it doesn't bind the ASGPR receptor, it's filtered out by the kidneys. It doesn't continually float around until the ASGPR um, gets it because of that uh, negative charge of the sRNA backbone. So you need for something that is not going to be taken up with those kind of first pass kinetics, you need a very long PK. So then you conjugate through these site-selective conjugation handles. This gives you a drug antibody ratio, in our case, of two. Um, the same molecule we can produce again and again and again. There's no lot variations here. If you put charged sRNA, the RNAi trigger, or ASOs onto this, what happens is the biophysical properties of that phosphodiester charged backbone, the orange here, um, dominates the PK of the antibody. So these will be, even though this molecule now is about 200 kilodaltons in size, it's too large to be filtered out by the kidneys, but scavenger receptors on the liver will recognize these charges and pull this out in a non-productive endocytosis into liver. So you need to neutralize those charge. Um, as I said earlier, we've done that with what we call a ribonucleic neutral using bioreversible phosphotriester groups, which are in blue and silver here. And at the end of the um, slides, there's a reference to this need it all in Nature Biotechnology 2014 that you can go into that detail. But we like that approach because that basically minimizes the influence of the RNAi trigger on the antibody. So it doesn't dominate the PK and all these great attributes of the antibody. This is essentially presents to the cell. The molecular surface is sculpted to present itself as if it was a protein to the cell, except proteases can't cleave off uh, phosphotriesters and RNases can also not cleave phosphates at phosphotriesters. They have to have a charged phosphodiester. So it adds metabolic stability and it essentially masks or cloaks the RNA trigger and prevents that in biophysical influence on the antibody. And this allows us to do DAR2 or DAR4 or potentially DAR8 you know, to be determined. Okay, but you need an endosomal escape. This alone, as I said, will not escape the endosome. If you put our first generation endosomal escape domain on there, it's too hydrophobic, it's exposed. And again, those biophysical properties dominate over all the attributes of the antibody. Having a highly soluble um, hydrophilic antibody here does not overcome this hydrophobicity. In fact, in antibody drug conjugates, even the little linker here can dramatically alter the overall PK of an antibody drug conjugate. And that's a much smaller cargo than what we have with RNA triggers or ASO triggers. So the idea is to develop the second generation of endosomal escape domain where we have a hydrophilic mask similarly to what we have over the top of the RNA that masks that hydrophobicity and that then minimizes the influence of that on the overall antibody. And that we think is the winning ticket in order to deliver an RNA therapeutic and get across this billion year old barrier is you need all three of this. You need a mass cloaked um, uh, RNA trigger. You need a targeting domain. It could be an antibody. It could be a centurion. It could be a small molecule. So long as overall the cargo and the endosomal escape domain 
do not, their biophysical properties do not disrupt whatever that targeting domain is. You can use any targeting domain here that you would like. And of course, um, it, in our minds for working on delivery for the last 20, 25 years, um, you need this, this hydrophilic mass endosomal escape. Um, something along this line has potential to work um, to be determined until we complete the synthesis and, and add it to cells. But hopefully um, by the time we get to the um, uh, delivery meeting in Sicily in March, the Castle delivery meeting, that um, we'll have this chemistry done and we can present that there. So um, I just wanted to reiterate that um, all of these approaches have the exact same problem, and that is escape from the endosome. So it doesn't matter what type of macro therapeutic you are, you're an ASO, an siRNA, you're a nanoparticle, you're a peptide, you're a protein, you're an RNP, they all have the exact same thing. Getting into an endosome is easy. Actually escaping from the endosome, that's the hard part. And it's even harder to do without um, inducing toxicity. So you've got to separate the toxicity. And every approach that I've seen to date that enhances endosomal escape, the tox rises up right at the level that's required to enhance endosomal escape. And so there's no window, therapeutic window there to do that. And so we really need new chemistry to be developed. Um, these are some of the relevant articles, the review articles um, from my lab, Anastasia Covro and John Watts lab at UMass, Rudy Giuliano down at uh, UNC, and then Matt Levy and I were the editors of a special issue of nucleic acid therapeutics where there's a dozen articles here on delivery of a variety of nucleic acids. This was published in 2018. And then these are the papers from my lab, the 2014 uh, Nature Biotech, um, Lone at all the science reports in 2016 on the first generation in zonal escape domains. And then Ian Huggins um, at all, we published a paper on making the antibody RNA conjugates with these site selective handles. And none of this would be possible without this incredible group of scientists that are both in my lab and have passed through my laboratory um, and beyond the current members that are in the lab that have done just an incredible job. But um, we also have a few of the with our first chemist that solved the fossil triester chemistry problem. And Brian Moon, who's now at Amgen, who is really the group that, that uh, all the fossil triester work kind of you know, stuck around and it really drove that and the current lab um, has really been driving us. So hopefully in 2020 will be a good year. And we also have several undergraduates in the lab and we have stolen money from anybody that's willing to get us here. So thank you and let's answer some questions. Thank you very much, Steve. That was really enlightening. Um, there were some questions already in the chat box if you scroll up. Yeah, okay. So, um, Here's question number one. Do you think the escape is necessary at the early late endosome stage or the lysosome for slower release? Yeah, this is a really good question because part of the problem is when you're biochem, and I'm really a bio, I'm a pseudo chemist, but a, a really a biochemist, molecular biologist by training. And when you try to track the majority of the molecules in the endosome, all of that is non-productive escape. So when you have 0.1% of the molecules escaping, you can't actually see them. You can't put a dye on them and look at it by confocal microscopy. Um, you can follow it by a phenotype, but that just tells you it did escape. And when you start to use inhibitors um, to stop transition from early to late endosomes or late to lysosomes, you really screw up a lot of things in the cell too. And when, when you have such a tiny fraction actually escaping, um, I think those experiments are just really hard. So it's not that I don't believe all the papers out there that have investigated this. It's that this is really, really hard cell biology and, and biochemistry to do. And if you make a lysate, as soon as you make a lysate of a cell to do straight biochemistry, 99 plus percent of the molecule that was trapped inside the endosome is now spread throughout that lysate. And so showing that it will bind to something, et cetera, is really not very meaningful. So that's a really hard question to answer. Um, my gut opinion is I have no idea. Um, I would say that probably some of, just like with the antibody drug conjugates, when you force endocytosis, you tend to pinch off an endosome that doesn't have all of the RAB um, 
GTPase protein is bound to it, the, the zip code essentially to move it correctly through the cell. And so those tend to get pushed off to the side. And when you view them with confocal microscopes and, and live cell imaging, they tend to just sort of sit there and move around a little bit, not ultimately uh, move down to a lysosome. And so I think by forcing into cytosis, it may end up as more of a reservoir for this slow 10 per hour escape than it would be if you went into a lysosome. Um, so yeah, the answer is I really just don't know. Um, all right, this one, hopefully hopefully, Dr. Dowdy sees your question. Oh wait, okay, for long turnover cells, neurons and hepatocytes, the lysosomal depot strategy likely works, um, but for quicker turnover cells, it might not be a viable and quicker escape um, may be preferred. So um, my view is that even with uh, Galnec, if we could enhance endosomal escape tenfold, you could lower the drug tenfold. And that may allow you to use other sequences that would be inherently toxic to go after genes um, that you couldn't go after today, even the liver hepatocytes. But most importantly, we're not able to treat cancer effectively at all because in my mind of the endosomal escape problem. So cells that are rapidly dividing and diluting the pulse of the synthetic RNA every time, yeah, this is a huge problem. We need to improve endosomal escape, not only a hundredfold, but a thousandfold. And if we can enhance escape enough where we lose the depot effect, we can always dial down the number of those hydrophobic units that are required for the endosomal escape. So um, yeah, I, solving the endosomal escape problem will not negate the depot. It'll allow you to modify the endosomal escape in, in concert with the depot effect so you can optimize a specific drug. Um, all right, let's see. All right, what's the size of the antibody RNA conjugates? Does endocytosis types such as tabulin pathway or clathrin pathway matter? Um, no, I don't think so. So the, the size of an antibody DART2 um, RNA uh, arc, antibody RNA conjugate is about 200 kilodaltons in size. And um, it doesn't matter what type of endocytosis that's taken up by. So whichever receptor you target the antibody or a small antibody like a Centurin, um, whatever uh, the receptor is that you're targeting, it has to be taken up by endocytosis. So once it's in the endosome, you need a universal endosomal escape domain, which doesn't exist today. And the version that we're synthesizing, we view as just version 1.0. And once that chemistry has been published, hopefully it'll just be a a huge um, uh, diversity of different approaches based on that idea that then uh, could be optimized even further. But if it truly is a universal endosomal escape, then it should work on the lipid bilayer, not the protein or cholesterol composition of a clathrin or a caviolin in the cytotic vesicle. And that's, that's the goal here. So therefore, we're not designing an endosomal escape device that only works in macropenosomes or clathrin. We're uh, developing one that will target lipid bilayers, but only be activated inside of an endosome because of the biophysical properties of that endosome. If it gets activated at the cell surface, it's going to be hugely toxic. And that's what's been seen previously. Um, okay, so a follow up question there is cleavable versus non cleavable linkers. Um, there are receptors for antibodies, for instance, inside the cell called TRIM21 that activate an innate immune response. If antibodies are inside of cells, it's because they're stuck to a bacterium and that bacterium has been able to escape the endosome into the cytoplasm of the cell and that activates an innate immune response to kill that cell because it's been bacterially infected. So yes, you have to separate the RNA trigger, the RNA therapeutic, from the antibody, the delivery device. And not only that, if you drag the antibody into the cytoplasm, that's an extra 150,000 Daltons that you gotta find a way to get across. So you jettison that inside the endosome, much like the way you went to the moon, and then the RNA trigger plus the endosomal escape domain gets across the lipid bilayer. And then that endosomal escape domain also needs to be jettisoned off of the RNA therapeutic. For siRNAs, all the conjugation is done to the passenger strand. That gets clipped in Argonaut 2, and that gets jettisoned. So that's an easy solution. 
Um, for ASOs, you would need a cleavable linker to separate it from the antibody or the targeting domain, which happens with Galnick, by the way, too. The sugars are cleaved off within the first hour of endocytosis from a Galnick ASO or a Galnick siRNA. So you're losing the targeting domain. And then the ASO with the endosomal escape could then escape into the cytoplasm. And then you would have to have a, a cytoplasmic uh, or nuclear cleavable linker to remove the endosome escape domain from the ASO. So yeah, it depends on um, whether you're double-stranded RNA, RNAi is your cargo, or whether it's a single-stranded ASO, whether you need one cleavable linker or two. And I should say for some antibody drug conjugates, there is no cleavable linker. What they do is they wait until it gets into the lysosome, the uh, proteases in the lysosome to degrade it, and you end up with this short one or two amino acid linker tag on the drug. Um, and that approach can work as well too. Um, is there any indication that ASOs display enhanced endosomal escape in certain cell types of the body, um, or is it just one less than 1% everywhere? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the problem has been, and, and most of this work um, in my mind has been done up at IONIS. Um, those guys have published incredibly detailed um, papers um, that are really quantitative um, examinations of these questions. And so the, the, the general answer is, it looks like the ASO in neurons and in uh, tissue sections across the CNS will go into all cell types there with differing levels depending on the regions of the brain, but that might be a PK exposure why there's differing levels rather than um, the ASO, the phosphothiolate backbone ASO being able to penetrate into those cells. So um, I would say that with the liver, with also the beta cell work out of um, the GLP, out of AstraZeneca in collaboration with Ionis, starts to suggest that the phosphothiolate backbone can in fact mediate escape in many cell types from the endosome. And that may very well turn out to be most. I think the reason we don't know that it's most is we don't have targeting domains to concentrate it in endosomes in a wide variety of cells. And so I think that's, um, th that's the missing piece of information here. But uh, I would say that the trend is, is going that way for sure. Um, okay. Steve, would you expect that scavenger receptor mediated uptake can redirect antibody conjugates with charged sRNAs to myeloid cells and macrophages? Um, yeah, so um, that's an interesting idea, isn't it? So to use, basically use the scavenger receptor to target different cell types. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I think it, it doesn't have to be that you just bind to the, um, to the uh, receptor, you know, like a ligand uh, type of binding that you could bind to the FC portion of the antibody and then get it stuck inside, you know, released so that the cargo would remain inside that endosome. Uh, and likewise, using the scavenger receptors to target the hepatocytes. For me, targeting the hepatocytes, I would do a Galnac approach just because that's so readily um, doable now. The chemistry is easy, you can buy these commercially. Um, for any academics and, and biotech research. So um, yeah, I think as long as whatever, I, mean, I like antibodies right now, but antibodies are very large um, and ultimately we'll change these to single strand antibodies um, and then we'll move to nanobodies and, and fibronectin type of repeats that are much smaller because the smaller you are, the deeper you penetrate into solid tumors when you're trying to treat cancer ultimately. Um, but I think the, the, my answer to the question really is that it's um, whatever you have that you can target a cell surface molecule that leads to endocytosis, to efficient endocytosis, I think that's all you need to do. Um, whatever that, that specificity involves, that's all you really need to do. So it doesn't have to be an antibody or a protein or a peptide ligand. It can be a small molecule like DUPA, for instance, that binds PSMA on prostate cancer cells that's overexpressed. Um, anything that has a high avidity for that and a low avidity for everything else. Um, I should also say that because RNA triggers, unlike antibody drug conjugates, which are like nuclear bombs, every cell they get into, they kill for the most part. With ARCs, antibody RNA conjugates or any RNA conjugate, it's okay if you get into five different normal cell types and 
one cancer that you're trying to target because you're going to be knocking down oncogenes that are overexpressed or mutated in the cancer cell that aren't expressed or mutated in the normal cells. And so having it taken up in normal cells is not a problem. It's just essentially inert, just like we did a, a GFP control, for instance, a non-targeting control. And so that allows you to use a much broader number of targeting domains of antibodies and other targeting domains that you could never use for an antibody drug conjugate because of the off-target cell receptor on tar or off-cell target cell receptor on target killing that really restricts antibody drug conjugates to a relatively um, small number of, of receptors. So um, I think that's it. I think, let's see if there's anyone that I didn't get here. Um, here's one. Do you think that the behavior of these conjugates and delivery strategies are similar in primary cells in relationship to tumor cells? Um, yeah, I, um, tumor cells in culture, of course, are, are easy to deal with, easy to grow versus the primary cells. But I think the only real criterion you need is that you need to have an, a marker that's rapidly endocytosis, efficiently endocytosis. That's the key. If you're going after it and it doesn't endocytose, or your um, it does endocytose, but whatever the ligand is that you're binding the receptor doesn't stimulate endocytosis, and that you could have a lot of receptor on the cell surface that never endocytosis, all of that's going to be non-productive uptake. And that's going to, of course, you know, lead to a much higher dose requirement. So the number one criterion is whatever you bind to, you either stimulate its endocytosis or it endocytosis so consistently that you just go along for a ride like transparent or folate receptor, for instance. Uh, let's just see if there's any ones here. So how, how stable are the fully modified sRNAs in the lysosome? Yeah, when you look at the work from Elnylam with the ESC plus chemistry, the highly O-methyl, very few fluoros, these are incredibly stable molecules. It's amazing how stable they are. And again, in glycerin is just a prime example where a single dose gives you a six month pharmacodynamic effect. I mean, it's just not drugs you know, that do that kind of thing. So yeah, it's absolutely remarkable. All right, I think that's it. So um, thank you. And if anybody has any further questions, my email is easy to find on the internet. Happy to address any questions and good day. Well, thank you very much, Steve. That was really, really great. Um, a lot of information that I wasn't aware of. Um, for everyone else, the recording will be available from the OTS website within a few days. And uh, please check out our other upcoming webinars. In February, we got um, Robert McLeod from uh, IONIS to tell us about antisense oligonucleotide design. And then in uh, March, we have Grace Chen from Harvard um, telling us about RNA, immune, circular RNA immunity. And uh, maybe we'll see some of you at the OTS meeting in Montreal. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Bye. Bye. All right, Petra. Yeah, um, I'm going to switch this off now. Okay.